Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Doom Productions podcast, a podcast put on by Doom Productions. Uh, I am Jordan. I'm Ethan. And we make movies and we make videos on YouTube about movies and filmmaking in general. And this is our pod- podcast where we uh, get together and we talk about things related to film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so today's episode was inspired by a viewer of ours. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he'll mind if we share who it is. Thomas S. Thomas S. has been commenting on our videos for a while. He's been... When was the first time do you think we noticed Thomas? He's been around for a bit. I can't pinpoint when, mm-hmm. but he's an OG in terms of the Doom Productions yeah. era. He's a name that whenever we pop up, it's a friendly face that we recognize. Yeah. And Thomas is a really gifted animator, and he's got some great stuff on his channel, so please go check out his stuff. I'm sure he'll have a comment down below at some point, so you yeah. can find his channel easy through that. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's awesome and doing some cool stuff. But recently, Thomas has been kind of on a Doom Productions binge. He's been crushing it. <laughs> he has been doing, uh, I mean... He's putting the rest of our viewers to shame, if we're honest. He's watching multiple videos a day, multiple podcasts a day, uh-huh. commenting on all of it multiple times. It's it's too much for me to keep up with, honestly. I mean, don't stop, Thomas, but... No, we're loving it. I'll be at work, and I'll think I respond to a notification, and then I'll go on my break, and then later I... I you know, there's 10 more notifications, yeah. which is great. I love it. Um, Best part of our day. I know. It's great. So whenever we see that little Thomas L. S. has left a comment, it, it warms the cockles of our heart. But recently, co- Thomas has crossed the line. Thomas has crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I was like, how much do we want to, like, g- like how dedicated Out to that him. bit do we want to be? I know. No. no. <laughs> um, recently, Thomas sent us a, an email. And this is a good email, not a bad email, um, with his suggestions on topics we could cover. And Thomas, thank you so much for this because every, I I don't know how much people know this, but we um, we struggle sometimes to come up with video ideas. Yes, coming up with ideas is probably the hardest um, thing for us. Like we we'll usually you know we when we get together and we meet, we're probably together for a couple hours. Probably one hour of that time is dedicated to what are we going to film today? What are we going to talk about today? And stuff like that. So, And those topics sometimes move very slowly mm-hmm. for us, or, or they're hard for us to find. And so Thomas sent us a list of a bunch of different topics um, for us to talk about, or that he, his suggestions of what we should talk about. So thank you, Thomas. Um, mm-hmm. And so this, this topic of today comes from, you know, Thomas. And so and that topic is... Uh, well, the way Thomas phrased it was, this is this is what it says verbatim. Do filmmakers owe anything to the viewers that made them? So we were kind of chatting a little bit, not like in depth of what this meant. Um, the phrasing of the question makes it seem like um, the filmmakers who are popular or well-known, do they, do they owe anything to their fans? That's what it sounded like. Yeah. Because it said for the viewers that made them. Um, but I think another interesting topic within that is do filmmakers owe anything to their audience? So I think we're going to be kind of broad. Yeah. Uh, but we will answer that question and discuss that. So I guess starting broadly and then going down, uh, what do you think, what do filmmakers owe the audiences just in general? Anyone who watches their movie, what do the filmmakers owe to them? Nothing. Nothing. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's such an interesting topic. I mean, when I, okay, when I first hear this or re- when I read this or I think about this, mm-hmm. my first kind of thought jumps to the experience of George Lucas. Yeah. Who, where that is a series that is very popular. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows Star Wars. You're not a fan of Star Wars. You're aware of it. Yeah. And you've probably seen one or two Star Wars movies. And everyone, it seems like, has an opinion of what Star Wars is. Yeah. Um, and so when you come to George Lucas and, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this doesn't apply quite as much now with Disney being the ones who own it, but up through the prequel era, um, 
everyone kind of felt like George had a duty to Star Wars of a certain way it should be told. Yeah. And when ever fans were unhappy with it, it the fan it looked as if the fans took it as like a personal attack. Yeah. Or like a way of like this isn't how you're supposed to tell Star Wars. This is what mm-hmm. Star Wars is to me. Yeah. And so my thought goes to that, that's just where my my first thing is is mm-hmm. do filmmakers have oh in a way of how they handle their movie because I feel like that's that's how you're interacting with your audience mm-hmm. for the most part. That's your main way is just through the movie and the story that you're telling. So is there a certain way that you should tell that story? Um, and largely, I think it is the director's prerogative to tell mm-hmm. the story however they want, whether or not a fan is going to like that. Yeah. So in that sense, no. But I do think that directors, especially if they choose to have an interaction, interaction outside of just making a movie, mm-hmm. once they're in a public spotlight, um, you do owe a sense of, like, I don't know, relating to your audience or, like, un- like. I don't know. I don't even know if you do owe anything at the end of the day, but I feel like if you're choosing to be in the public eye mm-hmm. in the way uh, any in any way other than just showing your movie, mm-hmm. I think you are show like showing that you want to be like involved with your audience in some way. Mm-hmm. Or, and I think just I don't know. It's it's so topical. I, I can't I can't land exactly on where I'm trying to say with yeah. this. Well, we made it about like five minutes into this podcast without discussing Star Wars. I know. Uh, that's the big one, though. No, so no, that's, it that's... is. We love Star Wars. We love Star Wars. Um, I think it's interesting with the George Lucas thing because... Uh, I'd like to apologize for move on about how vague that answer was and how Ethan pretty much ended with, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... <laughs> no, because that's a complicated situation because that is an example of a filmmaker in the public eye who would not be very successful without the fans. Um, he thought his movie was going to fail originally. He thought it was going to fail. The fans made it what it is. I don't think he can deny that. But then, even when it's out there in the public eye, who claims ownership over Star Wars? Because, um, I mean, I guess that's a whole... That's a philosophy, school of philosophy or thought or whatever. Like, who owns a work of art? Mm-hmm. Once it's out in the public, yeah. I lean towards the the artist. Like the, that's still the artist because like their names on it, they created it, mm-hmm. um, and you know. So those are his movies. Um, at the same time, he's also edited the movie, so they're no longer so they're continuously evolving and changing. Well, I guess not now so much, but they were they were for a yeah, long time for a long time. Um, and then it brings up that question, should the original versions be made available? Um, you know, does he owe people, like, the original copies of it? But then at the same time, the fans were pretty vitriolic towards him and his cast members and um, just him as in general. Like, they were pretty mm-hmm. brutal to him. So it's like, even if they were owed the original, why do they, des- like... Do they deserve it after the way? And I know they, that's a big generalization, but um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, well, like the, the, specifically the George Lucas situation of um, fans—I mean, filmmakers owing anything to the fans. I think in the George Lucas situation, um, I mean, it's when audiences go to a movie, they know that, like. What, what was a movie I saw recently? I, I went to go see Last Night in Soho. Yeah. All right. I paid to see that. Technically, me, along with thousands, if not millions of other people, we made that movie successful mm-hmm. because we're fans of Edgar Wright. Now, being an intelligent adult, I know that when I go to the theater and I see the movie, whether I like it or not, Edgar Wright is not going to come to my house and shake my hand and have a conversation with me and... I don't I don't expect anything more from him other yeah. than a movie. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I know that as a fan of Edgar Wright, Edgar Wright has no idea who I am. <laughs> I go to the theater, I see his movies, and that's it. That's the agreement of our it's not like, even a contract, yeah. but it's like that's what that those are the terms yeah. of our agreement. He doesn't know who I am, but he makes good movies and I enjoy his work. Yeah. Um so that's kind of what it is like to be a fan of something. I had a point where I was going with that. I think it was George Lucas. Yeah, so with George Lucas, the fans made Star Wars successful. 
but that's the agreement. Yeah. Like you go to the theater, you sh- you're like, yay, that's awesome. Um, I like your movies or whatever. But he doesn't owe them as a filmmaker. He doesn't owe them anything else. Like he's given the movies. That's kind of the, I guess, how it works, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, yeah. I can't remember where I was going with that. It's a tricky topic. This is like so, yeah. this is the most deeply philosophical topic <laughs> I feel like we've covered yeah. in a long time, if not ever. Yeah, because, let's see, do fans, do filmmakers owe anything to fans? It's Yes, it's true they made George Lucas successful, but he was just doing his own thing. Yeah. And it's not like he ever, it's not like he said, I'm going to give you this and he gave us something else. And it's, I mean, maybe like, I mean, he said he was going to give us prequel movies. He gave us prequel movies, whether or not you liked them or not, that's kind of on you. But you know what else is hard is the fact that even though the fans blanket term made some, can make someone popular, Mm -hmm. you are not the fan. You did not decide to make... You did not go to Last Night in Soho and be like, I am going to make this movie popular by me purchasing this ticket. Yeah. You just bought the ticket. Yeah. You did not give millions of dollars to make sure this movie made its money yeah. back and was a financial success. Yeah. So it almost feels like I didn't make this movie a success. Yeah. I paid 10 bucks and saw this movie. Yeah. And it ended there. I happen to enjoy it, so maybe I'll maybe I'll buy the DVD if I'm feeling really spendy yeah. and I really love this thing. Yeah, and that's I feel like where I don't know. I don't feel like I've ever made a movie successful, or that I feel like it's almost like a yeah. It doesn't quite line up to me in a way. I um, think uh, to wrap up the George Lucas thing. Yeah. I, I think I don't think he owes anyone anything really because mm-hmm. again he just made his movies. I mean, he funded, you know, Empire and Return of the Jedi and Mm -hmm. 1, 2, and 3. He funded all those movies himself. Um, He funded, put a lot of Lucasfilm money into Clone Wars himself, Mm -hmm. which kind of, I mean, from what I hear, that did not, as a, from a business standpoint, that wasn't a smart thing, but from a creative standpoint, that's what he wanted to do. Yeah. And so he did it, which is kind of all the, like, how he's always worked. He's always been very, um, like, I'm an auteur. Like, yeah. I'm the author of all this. Um, so, what does he owe to his fans? So, I think from a film standpoint, from a movie, I mean, he doesn't owe fans anything. Because they, because you yeah. show up to, the agreement is, I'm a fan of your work. So, I go to the theater, I see your movie, and that's that. Really, yeah. from a film standpoint. Do, does he owe anybody else anything more? I guess that's back to, like, the beginning of the questions. What do filmmakers owe? Like, to uh, I guess putting it for us, what do we owe our, like, fans. our fans, if anything? Yeah. I don't I mean, know. I guess it comes back to what do we, what have we stated that we plan to give our fans? And what that comes down to is we said at the beginning of the year, we're making five feature films. Yeah. Do we even necessarily owe that? I don't know, but that's... We're, I mean, we're, we're sticking to it. Um, and then also yeah. we've talked about, like, we make videos. We make three videos a week. Mm-hmm. I guess technically this podcast is not a video, so we've already failed. But it is a... It, it, you can watch it. You, can you may watch not it. get out much out of the visuals, but that's all right. Um, I should put a hide a secret image somewhere in the video. Oh, that'd be funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and with... Yeah, what do filmmakers know? This is a this is a great question, Thomas. Yeah, right next I, to the Shrek questions. I know, right? Here, right, <laughs> Shrek question. Another question Thomas asked was, which was better, Shrek one or two? Two. Um, I think they're both amazing, but oh. I I think two beats out one. Like I said in it, the car, uh, Shrek one walks, so Shrek two can fly. And and it's not a matter of one being bad or anything it's one is one is yeah. one is, one is good. an amazing story two's even better two yeah man they go they cover so much and that that movie feels like in my head like a three-hour movie yeah because they cover so much it's kind of like the better call Saul breaking bad thing like everybody loves breaking bad but 
most people won't believe you when you say better call Saul's even better. They're like, no way, it can't be better. And it's yeah. like, yeah, just watch it. It is better. It's amazing. I'll take your word and, for it. And like, well, yeah, you've never seen it. But like, <laughs> Breaking Bad is amazing. That's like, I think that's one of the greatest shows ever. Better Call Saul is even better, mm -hmm. which makes it even more impressive and everything. It's, yeah, it's crazy. Um, man, directors, own, filmmakers owing anything to their fans. What do they, I mean, from a filmmaking standpoint, I think we can both agree they don't owe anything from no. to their fans like if i if we have an audience and they're and we're popular filmmakers and we go out to make a, our next movie we can't cater to our fans necessarily that's so many people with so many different preferences and because well, when you try to please everybody you please, please no, no one. one the only person you should worry about is yourself and what you want to do because if you don't if you uh stop making work that interests you your work's going to suffer inherently mm -hmm. Now, you, that's not to say you can't, like, put... I think, like, how Quentin Tarantino will, like, put in a little Easter egg to his other movies mm -hmm. in his current movie to, like, reference. So, for hardcore fans, like, that's a cool thing. But d it, does he have to do that? No. Should he do it? No. He just does that because he wants to because yeah. it's a fun little thing for him. So, I think from a filmmaking standpoint, he he doesn't... Um, he doesn't need to do that but and he but he does it anyway because it's just a fun thing mm -hmm. i think when it comes to i think with something that's more applicable to more filmmakers is like reading reviews of like their fans or like taking their, taking their criticism time. yeah which is i mean people know how we feel about that but i mean i think i would go back to the george lucas thing there's millions of star wars fans in the world is george lucas expected to sit down and read every single one of their like reviews of his movies i don't that's absolutely impossible. that's no. <laughs> that's literally impossible he couldn't do that he doesn't have the time to do that yeah. for people like us or like smaller directors who like you know the reviews are out there and we could probably count the amount of reviews in our hands we choose to not to read reviews and that's not out of a disdain for our audience no no <laughs> well i mean we encourage people to leave reviews and all that kind of thing but we, we don't read them because I mean, that's a whole, this is a whole other topic entirely. When it comes to criticism, um, we find that if you listen to every single voice on the internet, you get really confused on who you should listen to. Yeah. So we choose to listen to trusted sources who have informed criticism um, and kind of understand where we're coming from. Yeah. But again, that's a whole other topic entirely. Um, but and We've covered it in past videos. You want to go back and watch yeah, it. Yeah, but... covered in past videos. Um, <laughs> And so we, we choose, to, and again, do we owe the fans to read the reviews if someone's a fan? Because we don't have millions of fans like George Lucas. No. We probably, we have the time to sit down and read the reviews. Um, should we? Like, do we owe our fans that, that, like, time to read their reviews if they sat down to watch our movie? That's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, I, clearly we don't think we do because we don't do it. <laughs> but you could make the argument, like, they sat down to yeah. watch your hour-long movie or two-hour-long movie. You can spend a couple yeah. minutes reading their review. But also, I didn't make my movie for it to get reviewed. That's, a, that's another good point. I know? didn't make my movie so that someone on YouTube or Letterboxd or Twitter could watch it just so I could get their feedback on my yeah. movie. I made my movie because I wanted to make this thing and I wanted it to be available publicly. Yeah. And, I mean, again, for us, we... Well, by, by the time we're done with the project, 99% of the time, we are ready to move on from it. Yeah. By the day it is uploaded and done. like We've already sat down and scrutinized it and we know it's flaws. Now, not every filmmaker is like that, but... No. That's how we operate. Yeah. The way we operate is we know the, our movie so well, like the back of our hands by the time it's released, that it's like, it's like old news. Yeah. And this applies to like, and that's not just criticisms or critiques of our work. That's positive. Yeah. Like, unless you're in our circle of people that we trust to give feedback of our, of our work, you could be on Letterboxd or wherever praising our movie. We're still not going to... We don't know. We don't know. Um... <laughs> And and it's kind of like I almost see like posting a review as the as the as the same thing of releasing a movie. Like we 
again, we our intentions are not to get... I mean, of course we want people to watch our movies, but our intentions are not, oh, we, we, need, we want our movies to be reviewed. We put out the movies because we just want to make movies and we want to put it out there for whoever to see. Mm-hmm. If you're writing a review, you can't... Again, kind of like George Lucas, I think. You can't expect us to necessarily sit down and read every review i mean again like there's not that many reviews i'm guessing but you are not putting out there necessarily for us to see i would assume if you are sorry yeah (laughs) we're you chose the wrong people um (laughs) but we love you we love you but like um you know just like i'm assuming you put the review out there because you just wanted to share your thoughts with with the world and that's cool and that's your right but again, you know, is the average person like putting up reviews of Star Wars? Do they? Does George Lucas owe them that time? Do, does Steven Spielberg or, or mm-hmm. Martin Scorsese do they owe all those reviewers? Do they owe them their time to read those reviews? Um, I don't think so. It seems like a two way street. Like you're free to post. We're free to post our movie. Mm-hmm. You're free to post your review. We're both free. Both sides are free to just ignore each other not listen like not listen or whatever not listen sounds bad but like ignore i guess yeah so i don't know but it is a, i mean it's an interesting question i mean the the re and i think again the reason we choose not to listen to people on the internet is for pre- preservation of our artistic vision mm-hmm. like in our skill set because again you could have someone who's posting about um like for instance saying um the color blue or red was a bad color you shouldn't use it and it's like well the the purpose behind that color was to show x y or z that viewer doesn't really understand but if i listen to that voice then it's like oh maybe i should never use blue or red again or maybe i should never use those colors and you see what i mean like your your process of thinking and interpreting your own movie becomes diluted because you're listening to all these other voices when really you should listen to yourself and your trusted peers yeah and people especially when you're on a platform like youtube where i'm assuming you're making films because you're starting out you're new Mm -hmm. you should be focusing entirely on how you make movies and what makes you excited to make them and what things do you enjoy and what's your voice if you stray away from that too early, you're going to hate everything you make because mm-hmm. it's not yours. You're going to stop. And that's yeah. the worst thing you could do is give up. I mean, obviously, if it's just not your thing, that's fine. You don't have to make movies. But yeah. that's a whole other thing that we've talked about. Of should you make movies or do you need to make movies? But No one needs to make movies, let's be no. honest. Like, you, like, the world has too many movies. Yeah. <laughs> there are millions of movies that are being made. Yeah. And they're still making them. The world doesn't need any more movies, but you do it because you you want to. You like it. Yeah. That's kind of how it works. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, that that, that question of do filmmakers owe anything to their audience? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, that's like another thing, too. Like, so I think we're kind of at a place whether or not we filmmakers owe the time of reading a review to their audience. We just don't do it. Yeah. Generally. Um, do they owe their audience anything else? Like an explanation. Like when you go see a movie, should filmmakers be expected to like provide a commentary or talk about their movie or try to explain anything? That's another question. Like if I go see a movie and excuse me, the the director is like AWOL. Like, there's nothing about the director who made it. And that's the director's choice. And I can't find any information about them. Do they owe, like, information to me? Are you kidding? That sounds awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I know it does. That That sounds so cool. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it really does. Dang, that sounds rad. I want to go to a movie where it's like, what's the director? There is no director. Yeah, like, the director's Like, we don't know who it is. It's top That'd That's cool. incredible. I don't cool care how I feel about the movie at that point. Like, I'm I'm hooked. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Again, I don't. I, I I don't know how much this applies to what you just asked, but I'm gonna lead into this anyway. I remember when we were in starting off in film school back in 2014, and mm-hmm. 
uh, our film professor, Bushra, she was saying, um, you, like, she was talking about clarity in your film or, like, mm -hmm. your message or your intent. She's yeah. like, you do not have the ability to go to every screening and stand in front of it and explain your movie to your audience. Yeah. So you should be intentional. And I don't remember exactly where she went with that idea. Yeah. But at the same time, I think, I mean, yes, you could, for your YouTube videos, put a, a video clip of yourself explaining your movie before at the yeah. end or wherever and tell your audience what it is. But I also think you as you, a filmmaker are like allowed to keep things for yourself in your own movies yeah. that the audience doesn't have to know about or understand or get. When we asked Joel Haver, you can see our interview with him about mm -hmm. there's a couple of things in, well, we asked him both on screen and off screen about mm -hmm. some, some stuff that happened in his movies. And he gave the same answer both times where he was like... Um, the question's the question, more interesting than the answer. The question you're asking is more interesting than the answer, which is his point. Um, kind of going back to like the death of... The idea of the death of the artist. The idea that the movie or the, the, the work of art, whatever you make, speaks for itself. Yeah. And that once a movie is released, you, the author, you have to ignore the intent of the... Of the um, of the author or whoever, mm -hmm. um, which at the same time, like you say, with YouTube and like the internet space out there, like think about it. when when they made the Last Supper or mm -hmm. whoever. Um, I don't know who I don't know any the artist. painting the painting the painting. Oh, that's Da Vinci, right? Is it? Pretty sure. I don't know. Pretty sure. See how dumb we sound right now. <laughs> Excuse me while I fact check us, but keep going with your point. Um. That was in a time when the internet didn't exist. Um, you couldn't like easily find out information. You would go to this place to see this painting, and it's not like you could watch an interview on anyone. Is it Da Vinci? Mm -hmm. It is Da Vinci. Okay, okay. I didn't look like a fool. Okay, cool. Thank goodness. Well, I did. Um, <laughs> so, like, back in the day, yeah, that information wasn't available. The work had to speak to its for itself. Mm -hmm. But today. When you see a movie, you, what do you do? You go online, you read IMDb about it, you read Wikipedia, you watch interviews with the director, the actors. Um, you could read letterbox reviews. When I think of reviews, honestly, I think of them more for the other audience members mm -hmm. and less for directors. But still, you can read information and yeah. facts about yeah. movies. And what happens when you go to an art gallery? You have a little plaque. You have a little plaque that tells the history of that piece of work. So, I mean, yes, I believe that work should speak for, the art should speak for itself, mm -hmm. but to to ignore it entirely, I think, like the information about the author and how that, their intentions with the work, I think to ignore that entirely is a little bit putting your head in the sand. Yeah. A little bit, because let's face it, there's some, there's some paintings out there that's like a picture, it's like a scribbles on a, on a board, but mm -hmm. then you read the caption that's like, you know, this is the last painting this creator did before they committed suicide. And then suddenly the work is transformed mm -hmm. from this little thing to this huge, like, oh my goodness, the context, like, makes it yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So, are movies the same way? Are they different? Like, should you just ignore context for everything? I don't, I don't know. I don't know the yeah. right answer. I, I think, I think there's more nuance to that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um I, I really don't, I don't know. I'm inclined to say that, like, again, work should speak for itself. But, like, meaning, like, whatever your intentions are, you should try to make them as clear as possible. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. Audience members know how to research. Yeah. Like, you can just look up stuff online, too. You could watch all these interviews and everything, like... People aren't dumb. Like, you can find this, most information is readily available. So, it's kind of hard to ignore that. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, back to the question. <laughs> I mean, do, do, I guess the question was do filmmakers owe their audiences an explanation? I think that depends on the, the filmmaker. Yeah. If they want to give that. Mm -hmm. If they want to, then sure. But if they don't want to, that's also no. fine. Yeah. 
it starts and stops with the filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. We've kind of already covered this, but I guess the, the original question Thomas asked was, um, do filmmakers owe anything to their the fans that made them? So that's implying a popular filmmaker. Mm-hmm. I think these questions become more nuanced and um, um, tricky to navigate when it's we're talking about people like us, where it's like, yeah, we have a handful of fans. We don't have that many. Um, but when it comes up to big, well-known people, I think then that question becomes a little bit more clear. Because again, the question of, does George Lucas owe people's time, like his time to people to read their reviews? No, because he's got millions of fans. But with us, it's a little more complicated because we probably, we do have the time, so. What's the reason for not? Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, so do do big directors owe their fans anything? I mean, usually they, whatever what, they would owe, yeah. they couldn't physically provide, I'm guessing. No. Again, it's, the, the, the contract is they make a movie, you go watch it, mm-hmm. you pay for it. Yeah. I don't expect anything more from a director. Maybe a good, you know, DVD and a, a nice behind the scenes would be a good bonus. <laughs> yes, that's what, okay, <laughs> Blu-ray and 4K, y'all need to step up your game with the special features. <laughs> yeah, where are they? Where's my behind the scenes? I never look at behind the scenes that's now. What... It's like, here's a five minute video, mm-hmm. movies production. It's like, what happened to my Peter Jackson, Star Wars webisodes, <sighs> all, all the good stuff from the 2000s. Yeah, it's crazy how DVD... Back in my day. Yeah, DVD, well, DVD, they, um, like, it was just the right time. It was the right new format for those supplementary materials to exist. And, yeah. like, gave it a reason and gave it a home. Because mm-hmm. today we have the internet, so it's not as necessary, but... It's oh, so nice. That would motivate people to buy the Blu-rays, yeah. I, I would assume. Um, I remember the... The Star Wars The Last Jedi, um, I remember there was a big push to buy that Blu-ray because it came with the director and the Jedi documentary. And I think yeah. Rise of Skywalker and Force Awakens might have been similar. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you know what was made me upset about the Force Awakens Blu-ray? Was huh. that it was, one, the initial release had no commentary. I think yeah. there's been a commentary since, but I was really hoping to see a commentary on that. But also, they promoted the the table read you know that famous picture now of like all everyone gathered they released it in black and white yeah they were like we're gonna have footage from the initial table read and i was like oh boy this is gonna be exciting and it was a little 10 minute featurette of the actors talking about the table read and like they showed like a couple little moments but no i was expecting it would be the camera set up around the room and it would literally be the table read. That would be incredible. That'd be so cool. I would have loved to see that. And you but... know they have footage of it. <laughs> so, uh, Disney, J.J. Abrams, or Kathleen K., whoever's, you owe us that footage. Give, I, would, yeah. I would love to see that Here's read. something the fans are owed. Just kidding. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, Man, to be on a flying wall on that, though. Yeah, I mean, more candid moments is what like I would love to see on, um, like... Behind the scenes stuff. So what we try to bring in our behind the scenes content as much as we can. It's hard when you're at our level yeah. and you have no behind the scenes person. It's the director like pulling out their phone and trying to get photos from people. But we do we do our darndest. It's it's tricky too because um, like to some extent you probably could overshare like yeah the, before a movie comes out anyways with oh, spoilers for sure. and everything. But no and yeah I would lo- but like just stuff that you don't usually see covered in behind the scenes like. I mean, they always talk about, they'll talk about filming in vague senses. Yeah. Like when it comes to big Hollywood behind the scenes. But no one ever talks about, say, for instance, like, let's let's zero in on the first day of shooting. Like yeah. the very first scene we shot. Like, what, who, like, I know those, those big productions, it's kind of hard to say, but like, as a DP was setting up. How how was the DP like directing their crew? Yeah. What were the actors doing at that exact same point? What was the director? Was the director by the craft and service table? Mm-hmm. Was the director by the DP? Was the director by the you know like all these little nuanced? Who things. is he meeting with? What's what, he? Yeah. 
which I see if you're not like, if you're not into that, you probably won't be interested. You just want to see like Will Smith talk about whatever, you know, yeah. how he got prepped or like what the hardest scene to shoot was. But you don't really care about those everyday stuff. But but those are so fascinating to us. like other filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, um, I can't remember how he got on that, but good behind the scenes. But well-known filmmakers owing anything to their fans. I mean, I'm going to say, this is my answer now, but, like, no. Just because, yeah. again, the sheer amount of fans, like, I think of, like, celebrities walking down the street and then, like, them being surrounded by paparazzi and, like, sign this, take a picture, and it's, like, whatever, and it's, like, yeah, that might be fun for them, it may be, but, like, Probably they're, not. they're just going to get coffee or whatever. They don't. They're living they, their life. Don't they also do... I mean, you are a fan and you, I guess, are stocky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they, like, they deserve to have, you know, you know, time alone and just to have live a normal life. I don't think they deserve to be, like, hounded with questions or... No. People. Of course, that's... Like, I don't... I can't think of any director who would have been, like, oh, my gosh, take a picture of me. Yeah. Um... Who's it? Spielberg's probably the most well-known director in the world, right? I would assume so. I mean, his name is so, like... Everyone knows his name. You can just throw Spielberg out there, and everyone was like, oh, movie director. Mm, who would be bigger? I mean, it's like Spielberg, it's, it's George Spielberg. Lucas. But even though I don't think George Lucas... Quentin Tarantino's in this, probably... Quentin Tarantino. Most people know his name. Christopher Nolan, maybe? Yeah, yeah. No judgment on quality or anything, but, of course, but, like... um. These are like without it, like these are household names. Yeah, generally. Um, can't think of any more like, like Kubrick, I guess. No, but that's, that'd be but like that's older now. That's older, and no one's watching. Like, I mean, again, no comment quality, but like he's just he's popular with film people. Yeah, and maybe for an average moviegoer, you've seen some of his movies, but you're not like, probably not like. Kubrick. Oh my gosh, Kubrick! Yeah, <laughs> maybe you are. That's cool. Yeah. If you if you are like that, that's cool. But um, I would assume that, like you said, Spielberg, Nolan, Tarantino, and I wouldn't expect them to like again because you could again you can make the argument like oh their fans paid for everything but it's like made them successful, but it was the studio that gave the filmmakers the money. It was the oh. studio that took that chance on them if anything it would seem like the filmmakers owed more to the studio rather than their fans but the fans also made them popular and like without the fans they wouldn't have made money it's like one of those questions that can't have an answer it's the chicken the egg question um because again we're at 600 something subscribers 646 out of right now yeah something like that i don't know uh Obviously, having an audience is like a goal of ours, and like wanting, we want people to see our stuff and be excited to yeah. see our stuff. But we're not making the audience for people necessarily. We're making it for ourselves. The movies for our people, you mean? Yeah, the movie for for yeah. people. Obviously, the YouTube channel is like. I think that's where it gets interesting for us because it's like, do we owe people anything? Like, from our YouTube channel. Not excluding our movies, but, like, behind-the-scenes content or types of videos or yeah. anything like that. I don't know. No, because, I mean, it's just something we choose to do because we like doing it. Yeah. It also when gets our movies out there yeah. more. Um, I mean, does anyone owe anybody anything? <laughs> <laughs> now this is a whole life kind we've of we've like boiled down the essence we've to con- like this we've transcended cinema. baseline question does anyone owe anybody anything because it's again it's like well you owe your parents but you didn't ask to be born and they chose to have you so they wanted you i'm assuming anything, they owe you yeah but maybe they were shitty parents and it was like and it was like okay then it's a complicated question. I don't now. I don't know if I own a, owe anybody anything except the United States government for their student loans. 
That's the only thing yeah. I'm sure of. You I don't... only owe people things if you enter into the contract of which you state that you they are giving you something and you are giving them something back. But morally, ethically, because oh, the law wait. doesn't equal ethics. Yeah. You could owe someone something legally, but that doesn't mean that it's right. That's true. Like there's people who are behind bars and it's like they don't deserve to be, yeah. but they are. So the law doesn't equate What's morally ethical? Yes. This is the most absurd <laughs> film discussion I've ever heard in my life. My girlfriend majored in Why philosophy. Why is she on this? <laughs> uh, she'd probably be like, she's probably like clenching her fists and being like, "I, you're not asking the right questions." You or idiots! You, yeah, you idiots. <laughs> um, we need to have her on here just to to set us straight. Yeah. We need a third voice. A voice of reason. Or I guess someone who's informed about, like, philosophy and whatnot. Someone who knows what they're talking about. <sighs> Does anyone know anybody? Any? <laughs> <laughs> if you're still listening right now, can you comment, like... Are we like, making sense? I need, Do we like, sound like smart people like or a are we safe, sound like dumb people? I need, like, a safe word right mm -hmm. now that people can comment, like, egg or something. Mm -hmm. Comment egg down below if you've uh, made it this far. You can be Do the in-group. We'll owe you something if you do. Does anyone owe anybody anything? <laughs> now that I'm, now I'm thinking about the law kind of thing, because like, well, I'm thinking like more, like uh, kind of morally again. Like, do I owe you as a person like respect? Do I owe you anything? I have an answer for that. Actually, I think oh. I think in general, what you do is you start. If I don't know you, I give you 100 percent of my respect. Yeah, as because I respect you as a human being. You have your own experiences and mm -hmm. history. We're all just human beings on this planet. I respect yeah. you, but I don't know you. As soon as you do something that I don't, maybe not necessarily I don't agree with, but something that I find morally questionable. Yeah. Um, I start losing points. Yeah, and that's not to say, like. Because I can uh, disagree with people. And still respect them. And still... That's super healthy. That's great. healthy. That's good. Or like... What's it? I'm trying to think of an example. I can't think of an example, but like... This if is I like, don't tip. Like if yeah. we're hanging out and you find out I don't tip. This is a real life example. Yeah. <laughs> I found out someone I know doesn't tip. Yeah. So like, okay, that's actually a good example. So like if, if you don't tip, I don't agree with it. If I were you, I would tip. But again, that's something that's little. That yeah. It's like, well, I don't lose respect for you. I just... It's not enough to bring that respect. It would have to be something like... I, tr I trip grandmas sometimes. Yeah, like something like, oh, like, I killed a cat. Or I, like... Like, I hate gay people. Or yeah. I hate, like, oh, okay. trans people. Like big, or minorities. Big, big bats. Yeah. Or, yeah. I don't like, like the Star like Wars prequels. <laughs> I, I don't like the Star Wars prequels. Um, if it's something like that's where it's like starts to go down. But even like you could even, and that's pretty big. That's pretty, it's important, but it's big. But like even like I'm trying to think like, oh, this person, they stole from this person or this, you know, whatever. Or they, they didn't treat their kids or their mom right or something mm -hmm. or like again i still don't know all the answers but like you know stuff like oh this person likes to gaslight people it's like yeah. oh okay i maybe respect is like wouldn't go down i don't know not even respect that's just i put a block between me and that person yes i'm gonna put a i'm gonna put a wall up a between barrier. us yeah a barrier because i ain't getting involved with that because I'm, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you do things to protect yourself. Like, because you can still, I mean, there's people who it's like, hey, like, you're cool and everything, but um, I'm not going to trust you with my, like, personal information. Like, yeah. I'm not going to tell you personal details about myself. Yeah. And even then, it's not because I don't respect you, but I don't trust. Oh, see, what's the difference between trust and respect now? That's a whole Ooh. other. Oh, my gosh. What is what this discussion? <laughs> this was not on the cards when we were driving <laughs> earlier. This was not even close to what we were thinking about talking about. 
I thought I had an answer to the, do you respect people? I think that's that's where I try to start, yeah. anyways. I no, you, I give you, you if baseline, I don't know you baseline full respect. Baseline full respect. I I can you, yeah. That's I great. I will say you would have to do something to make me lose respect, but what that is I couldn't quantify in any way. It's necessarily yeah. It's person to person, situation to situation. Because even just w- the read of the yeah. Because even when people disagree i feel like it is better generally to you know take the high road yeah. generally not to stoop to their level and be like yeah. oh i don't work because what does disrespecting someone look like and disagreeing and disrespecting are two very different things too yeah because i and could it's like, say even if you respect i yeah. love pineapple on my pizza it's almost like mm-hmm. i hate that does not morally set one above the other some people would disagree well i'm talking but... about like like even like you know someone hates you know, minorities or LGBT. Oh, okay, you're like going like that. further. Okay, I see. <laughs> like, again, some people would think Doom that. Productions is very pro, pro LGBT yeah. and women's rights. And, yeah, we work. And, yeah, and my I am a the... minority, so I would be. <laughs> it would be shameful for me not to uh, yeah. support those groups. But yeah. I mean, they're in the crew. It's a. It's an. Eth- it's a. Interesting. Like, because even if someone, because because I've had experiences where people are like yelling at me and disrespecting me, and it's like, I'm not throwing it back at them. I'm not disrespecting them. I mm-hmm. might not respect them for their decisions, but I'm not actively doing anything to show that. If that makes it's pretty yeah. passive. Yeah. Oh, gosh, what are we talking about? Oh my goodness. So anyway, do directors owe their fans anything? <laughs> <laughs> How long have we been talking and rambling about this? I wonder how much of this we've actually talked about. 47 before. minutes. That's pretty good. We've In 30 the... minutes, I know we were still talking about film. So okay. it's only like a 20-minute tangent. Is there any... Let's reel it, Let's reel it back to movies. Um... <laughs> we're going to try and salvage this as best we can. Gosh. Um... Thomas, I hope you enjoy this episode. You better listen to all of it. Yeah. Um... Doom Productions gets philosoph- or philosophical. I philosophical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gosh. I don't... Do directors or do filmmakers owe anything to the fans that made them? I think, okay, you know what? That question, Thomas, the way you phrase that implies that the fans were responsible for the directors making it. The fans that made them is an interesting yeah. wording. And I'm not condemning or condoning it. I'm just pointing out that that's an interesting phrasing. Because when someone is successful in filmmaking, who is responsible? Yeah. Because was advertising, the people who marketed the movie, did they make it successful? Because they got it out to audiences. Would the movie have gained the same success on its own? Would, and like, because they don't give movies to anyone like no one would have made yeah. wild boys um hunt yeah. for sasquatch no one made they're fans of it but we ultimately put in the work yeah i mean zach put in the work. yeah zach <laughs> zach and the crew zach we worked crew, on it we worked on it together yeah we um no I mean, yeah no one came up and approved it no one was like i see something in you guys mm-hmm. make this movie it was just, we were like, we're going to do this. But that being said, it is our most successful video and our most successful movie. How do you measure success now? Because <laughs> it's viewed, two questions. Is it, is it yeah, yeah, because is it the audience, is it the number of eyes that have seen the thing that makes it popular? Is it general positive versus negative? Mm-hmm. Or is it the author slash director's intent of how the movie is received? The, the, let me look up the question because it's the fans that made them. Made them implies that they've made it. So what does making it look like? Because for us, making it, we have already made it. Yeah. Because making it for us is where we are able to make feature films. We've made We're feature films. We are doing that. We don't have any struggle in making feature films, relatively speaking. Yes. Feature filmmaking in itself is a struggle. But So do filmmakers, so do we as filmmakers... Oh, I mean, in that from that perspective, our fans were they they were an after thing. They the fans came, came 
as yeah. we've made more stuff. Yeah. And they like what we make, so they stick around, and we get more views on our stuff. But mentally, we've we're it's not like they made us. It's more like we... We, we made, made us, made it. Yeah. and they are coming alongside us. Yeah. And just supporting us and enjoying the work as we go. I'm assuming that... Not the, even supporting us. I mean, supporting us yeah. emotionally. Like, say, hey, good the movie. The views and everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but for... I'm assuming the question means... It, let's say you're, like, critically, uh, money-wise and view-wise, you are successful. Like, let's... I'm, I'm assuming the question's asking that. Like, if you are... Making money doing your thing. Mm -hmm. If there's lots of people watching, if lots of people like it, do those filmmakers owe anything to their fans? And again, I think it's a chicken and the egg question a little bit because it's like the filmmaker put in the work. Yeah. The viewer didn't. But the viewer made, like, without all of the viewers collectively, the filmmaker probably wouldn't have, wouldn't wouldn't have the views and wouldn't have the, the money, I'm assuming. Yeah. So I guess the counter question we're asking is who make who really makes the filmmakers? Yeah. If if we're assuming that viewers make the filmmaker, I guess that's the you have to answer that question. Assuming is that there more do. that they receive after that? Then? Yes, you have to assume like okay, let's let's for argument's sake, for the sake of this conversation, let's say that filmmakers do are made by their fans. Mm-hmm. Do they owe anything to their to their viewers? And, okay, t- the question's as viewers, not fans, actually. Yeah. So it's not even assuming that everybody who watches your stuff likes your stuff and supports mm-hmm. you. That's just, I, let's say, I saw it. you yeah. clicked on a YouTube video, or you watched it on Netflix, or went to the theater and bought it, bought a ticket. Do filmmakers owe anything to those viewers? For big filmmakers, again, I would say no, because physically they can't really do much. Yeah. Like, they can't personally greet them of course they can say in interviews but yeah and then it becomes all right if you think that there's a threshold of when you can and can't what's the number you put on that i know when am i no longer obligated to respond to every fan i know so that's um but again let's take it back to someone like us people with like dan lots or or Merdul, or yeah. whoever. Um, sorry, filmmaker friends, we don't mention. <laughs> all of you are included. All of you, yes, all of you. Um, do they owe anything to the viewers? I say, let's specific, let's narrow it down to the YouTube Yeah, space. YouTube filmmaker space. Obviously, when you click on a YouTube video you assume there's going to be a description box. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a description box on everything. Whether or not you put anything in there is up to you. Do, do filmmakers on YouTube, do they owe their viewers a little blurb, a blurb in, a synopsis, in, in the description box? Do you, yeah. Is that where you explain your movie? Is that where you... Even your about page, if you don't put it there. About page, yeah, that's another... Do you share a video of, hey guys, this is me, I made a new movie, check it out. So obviously, so when I think about YouTube, I think of someone like Filthy Frank. Yeah. So obviously his videos were, and the descriptions were very um, like offensive and, and crazy and wild. And that was the point of it. Because if you went to his about page, it said, this is a performance art page. This is like a parody of, I can't remember the wording exactly, but on his about page, he explained... This channel is a joke. It's fi- yeah. it's uh, fictional. Don't take anything seriously. That's the point. Yeah. So then, when you go into his other videos, you understand. If you assuming you've read the about page, you understand that. Oh, this is like supposed to be out there and crazy and offensive and all yeah. that. I don't know how that ties into filmmakers, but that's what I think about when I think of YouTube yeah. specifically. When I think of, there's a level of transparency that most YouTubers subscribe to. Yeah. Pun intended. Um, which is, I'm making this thing, but I'm also sharing who I am with you as I make this thing. Or yeah. I, I'm putting a part of me in this that I'm letting you in on. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't all of me, but this is the 
the public mm -hmm. side. Um, so I think it's interesting when fans get attached to that um, and when they kind of decide what they want and don't want from a creator. And I think it's interesting seeing the good and the bad that comes from that yeah. when you're watching a creator. Like, there are some people who will lean heavily into my fans like this kind of content from me. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't enjoy making that content, I will make it because there are more clicks to it. Mm -hmm. But that can also break a channel. And like how we mentioned earlier, your enjoyment of making that stuff is going to go down. Yeah. And then the channel is probably not going to succeed because your audience is going to see you're not interested in making the content anymore, most likely. So they're not going to watch your videos anymore. And then you're mm -hmm. not going to make as much stuff. And you're not going to want to make videos, maybe at all. Um, I'm sure there's tons of channels on the platform that have gone that way. And I also think of, too, like, the view again, the viewer does make the YouTuber, like, channel, the YouTube channel. Yes. Um, but it also costs the viewer nothing. Like, yeah. If, if we're measuring success, a successful YouTube filmmaker by their subscribers, um, you don't even have to watch anybody's stuff to subscribe to them. It yeah. costs you a click. Now, if you're sitting down watching... Then it only costs you time. It only costs you time. You can choose to click away at any point. There's you can no, also have it in the background and not watch there's it. There's no monetary commitment. Yeah. If anything, like we probably have... There might be a viewer or two who presses play on our video, but then walks away and doesn't watch it. Yeah. I'm assuming that by viewers you mean someone who sits down and watches it on YouTube. They choose, and I, I think they they choose to watch it. They can click away at any time. So, does the filmmaker owe them anything on YouTube? I don't know. I, I, I still lean towards. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. But it's an interesting The most that they owe is... No, because I don't even owe... I, I don't even owe... Even if I love making feature films, mm -hmm. I do not owe my audience another one. Yeah. I don't have to show another one. No matter how much I love mm -hmm. showing my feature films to my audience. So I, I would even hesitate to say... Because I, I was think, trying to think, like, do they at least owe, like making more videos that like do i owe making more videos that i enjoy making and i still think the answer is no because it doesn't matter how much i love doing it if i decide i don't feel like making it even yeah. if my i enjoy it my audience enjoys it it's a win-win and they're like making me successful by watching it i still don't have to make the next one mm -hmm. i'm just like no nah, not not for me yeah I think this podcast has been a long way of saying, I don't know, yeah. but no. Yes. That's exactly it. Uh, all I can say personally, I guess we, I guess we can close with this, this thought, I guess, question or exp explain ourselves if we don't already, if we aren't already clear. Do we feel that you and I, do we feel that we owe our viewers anything i think no but yes we love presenting our stuff to you guys and we love creating content that you enjoy yes so do we think like do we have to do we owe them no but no. we do it because we want to yes i guess that's what we answer we want to be here in this space yeah, like, I, I think if you're a filmmaker, you probably enjoy the viewership and you want to... It's a community you're building around yeah. your work, and that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, But if one day we decided to wake up and be like, you know what, we're done. We're going to walk away. We'll do it. We'll post like a goodbye video. Yeah. And then we'll... <laughs> we'll just quit. And then we'll quit. And then we'll walk away. And like, do we owe anyone an explanation? Maybe. No, not really, but... We, we would share as much as we felt like we wanted to, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't do more. Because what if something, like, really dramatic happened? Like, um, 
like say like there's a death in one of our families or something and it's like okay we need to take some time Heck, or, what if i died yeah, like if you died or i died like do we have contingencies for that no joke yeah we do <laughs> <laughs> um we talk about that every now and again during a project we, we'd st we'd probably stop the channel for you know oh, we might wow. just disappear yeah and, if you know. at all because when indie mogul disappeared for those years remember that yeah they got bought out someone I think else owns who, them now. who revealed that information was there a video that was like we we were bought I, out i think it was if i remember right it's been a bit um because uh, I remember the current host uh -huh. and Griffin met up and did a thing. I, th I don't know if it was a podcast or a long form video or how I got yeah. all this. It was kind of scattered, I think. But I think there was one video they did that talked about how YouTube owned Indie Mogul. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Beck, the original mm -hmm. host, had yeah. sold it to them and was working with YouTube. YouTube decided they were no longer going to fund it. Mm -hmm. And that was during the Griffin Hammond era. But Russell was also co And Russell. They were in separate locations. Yes. And then the channel died, and then the current host they purchased it. I but think. when when it died after Russell and Griffin, mm -hmm. I can't remember how I knew that it was stopped and they were bought out. I think it was in their individual channels. I think so. I think Russell probably was more likely to have shared that information because he had his chan I mean, he was pretty active. Is For he a while. active? Not that I've seen at all recently. Get some good stuff because he's. I think he's doing a whole bunch of screenwriting stuff now. I Regardless, I guess do. that's that's a situation where it was beyond the creator's control. But did the company that buy out, or I guess did YouTube, because I guess they own it, and they stopped funding it, did they owe the subscribers? And, well, I guess they didn't. Does YouTube the platform deserve to owe anything? Oh, no, we're oh, going down God, a rabbit hole. Okay, oh, okay, boy. we, we got to stop. Pulling ourselves back stop. out. We got to stop. We got to stop. Okay. <sighs> if you enjoyed this episode... <laughs> Yep. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your viewership and ears. If you're listening on Spotify, head on over to your YouTube channel to check out our other videos. It's where the good stuff's at. Our feature films. Um, hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Um, if you aren't subscribed already, you know, you might. It takes a couple seconds out of your day. But one day, you know, a really cool video might come up in your subscription. So, And it means a lot to us. And so we, don't you. We, don't, we don't owe you anything. <laughs> but we will. We will promise. Yeah. Uh, we think we make cool stuff. We'll make, we promise you we'll make the stuff we enjoy making. Mm -hmm. And we hope you enjoy it too. And we'll if keep you making do, it until we don't want to. <laughs> yeah. That's our contract. Preach you know. it. Yeah. Uh, we promise we will always be ourselves yes. on this channel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and with that, I guess we'll, we'll sign off. Thank you for watching uh, and, and listening. And we will see you on the next one.